Well, most of you know, um, I just got back from some time away, and the time away started uh, with the first weekend getting the privilege with my wife to travel to Texas to celebrate my oldest daughter's graduation from college. And we had a fantastic time. In fact, she's seated right here in the front row, and today is also her 21st birthday. So, happy birthday. That's what makes me feel old. Now, on for the, the message. Um, one of the many privileges and blessings of that weekend was getting the chance to go with my daughter to the church that she now calls her home church, a place she worships at regularly, where she serves and where she's being discipled. Uh, she gets in, she's gotten involved in ministry. And then one of the other cool things she's doing is she has a pastor who's working with her and a few other student athletes who are now reaching back to other student athletes at her college. And she's gonna continue that this year as well as she uh, goes to graduate school. And it's a joy every time I go. And she has this incredible pastor. Uh, his name is Pastor Bo. And that, I think that's the coolest pastor name anybody can ever have, Pastor Bo. Uh, when I come back, I want to be Pastor Bo. That's, uh, that's what I want to be. And Pastor Bo it just has this incredible heart and an incredible teaching gift. And that Sunday, I had the experience that I think a lot of you have, maybe all of you have, on a Sunday here. You have those moments where you think to yourself, wow, God is speaking to me right where I'm at, right where I need to hear it. I got a, a note from someone just this last week, uh, just you know, thanking me for the word and, and then saying, it's like you followed me around all week. And I, and I say, you know, to be honest with you, yes, I was. I was following you around all week long. That's how I know. No, no, I have the same experience you do. And I had it that Sunday, which is, you know, it's amazing to me how often God has something very specific for me to hear. And God speaks to me. You see, what I'm thinking about in my life, and I've been talking about this the last couple of weeks, and what I'm thinking about what we're doing in the life of our church, this one question comes to the surface. What does it mean to follow Jesus? I mean, really, this is not a new question. It's, it's not even a surprise question. It's getting at the heart of a question that all of us have, and, and I have it too. What does it mean for me to follow Jesus in my profession? What does it mean for me to follow Jesus at this stage of my life? What does it mean to follow Jesus in each and every decision that I'm facing, in every circumstance? It's what we call the question of a disciple. A disciple asks these questions. A disciple is a follower of Jesus. What does it mean to follow Jesus? I want to look at a passage this morning that I heard Pastor Bo talking about that morning, and it was speaking to my heart, and I thought, wow, it's great. And I've heard this passage and read this passage from Luke chapter 10 many times, and he brought out new things that I don't know if I've heard it before, but it certainly landed on me in a fresh way and opened my eyes to the truth and the beauty of the wisdom of God. And that's what I hope to bring forth this morning. So the word of the Lord from Luke chapter 10, and think about it in terms of that question, what does it mean to follow Jesus? Because that's at the heart of this story. Verse 38 to the end of the chapter. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. And the Lord answered, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed or indeed only one. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. All right, this is... God's word to us this morning. Let's look at it closely. First, I want to put to bed a common misconception about this passage 
that many of you perpetrate against each other, okay? Imagine with me a scene where one person wants to sit and relax on a couch, and another person is in the room busily working. I mean, busily working, like working, 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 working. And imagine that person start to get upset with the person on the couch. Can any of you relate to this? Okay. Now, if you're like me, you, you look at your wife and you say, she's in this service too. You look at the person who's busy working and you say, okay, Martha. Now, for those of you who are biblically aware of that story, you know that it's relating to this passage and, it, and you're saying to that person, listen, I'm choosing the better thing. I'm sitting down and I'm resting. Don't disturb my groove, Martha. I hate Pastor Bo because he totally took away that excuse for me. And just so you know, that's a misapplication of the passage. So for all of you who've been made to feel bad because you are work-oriented and you think that working is rest, and you know who you are. I want to sincerely apologize on behalf of all those who've misused this passage against you, okay? Because that's not what it's about. It's about something else entirely. You see, this passage is getting at the heart of what it means to follow Jesus, what it means to be a disciple. In fact, it raises this question What does it mean to sit at Jesus' feet? Now, I want to address that question, too, because the modern reader can get really messed up by some of the phraseology if they don't understand what it means. We might, for example, even think what Jesus is saying is demeaning, that Mary is sitting at his feet, okay? But it's not. That's not what it means. In the modern first century, there's, a, there's a, a radically different meaning to sit at someone's feet for a teacher to have followers seated at their feet is a compliment. Because don't forget, Mary is not only seated at Jesus' feet, but who else is seated at Jesus' feet? All the other disciples. You see, they're all sitting there together at Jesus' feet. And what you need to understand is to sit at Jesus' feet means to be a follower. In fact, it is one of the first things we can say about the phrase, someone who sits at Jesus' feet is their disciple, or at a teacher's feet is their disciple, and a disciple is a follower, a follower of a teacher. So these 12 men the apostles, and Mary are seated at the feet of Jesus, and that is the posture of discipleship. You see, Jesus is affirming something in this passage in his interaction with Martha. He's affirming what the disciples and Mary are doing as being first and most important. In fact, Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're, you're bent out of shape about a whole lot of stuff, Right? But only a few things are needed. In fact, only one thing is needed. And this is what he's saying. Here's the one thing that's needed. It's to see me, Jesus is saying, to see me correctly and reorder everything else in your life around putting me first. You see, Martha's bent. She is upset because her priorities are out of order. Let me explain that a little bit more fully. You see, Martha has expectations for herself. 
but she also has expectations for her sister as well. See, Martha's expectations are expectations she's learned, a pattern of relating, a pattern of thinking, a pattern of living that she's learned probably from her mother and reinforced by the culture in which she lived, right? So as Martha is doing everything in her power to serve the men, she's doing what everyone else or what she believes everyone else expects her to do, including the way she thinks about herself. And she's also mad at Mary because Mary is not doing what Martha expects and what she believes everyone else expects. Now, Martha also gets a bad rap because, quite frankly, she's the one that verbalized the expectation. But I can guarantee you, based on reading the bumblings of the disciples in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that they were thinking the same exact thing. They were probably sitting there quietly because, you know, they've opened their mouths and gotten in trouble before. They're probably sitting there thinking, when is Jesus going to tell Mary to get to work? But I'm not going to say it. Hopefully Peter will say it. Right? You see, everyone in the same room had the same thought except for Jesus. And I think Mary. Mary. Mary said, listen, I don't care what everybody else thinks. I'm going to sit at Jesus' feet. I'm going to put Jesus first. I don't care what the wisdom of the culture teaches. I'm going to put what Jesus teaches above all of that. Now, I love the interaction, too, because here comes Martha. She's finally had enough. Have you all seen the movies Inside Out? If you haven't seen it, there's, they render the personality inside of us, and we all have different emphasis, but there's like four different colored versions. You know, there's the red guy, and the, he gets mad. And the blue one is like melancholy, and green is envy. And so they're all inside of us, and some of us are dominated more by one personality style than the other. And um, the red guy, I can see this in Martha right now, the, the guy with the red, when he finally has had enough, when he's finally gets to the end of himself, he blows his top and just totally explodes. That's Martha right now. Lord, don't you care? What's wrong with you, Jesus? Can you imagine saying that to the Lord? What's wrong with you? Don't you care about me? And here's the, my next favorite part, because I'm raising teenagers and how many of you know that when you raise children, you have to switch strategies up every once in a while? Right, so here's been my strategy lately. In fact, it, it happened yesterday. Hey, kids, cover yours. Here's my strategy yesterday. The kids, two of the kids were arguing with each other, and they came in, and they're arguing, and one of them was literally doing what Martha was doing. Dad, make, I won't tell you who it was, but make my sibling do what I want them to do. And I was working. I'm just working away, just having a good time. I wasn't sitting on the couch. I was working, okay? And I looked at my child, and I just kind of went. And I went back to work. <laughs> Completely ignored it, right? I'm like, I was thinking to myself, you're not triangling me, uh-uh-uh. And then I, when the child walked away, I just prayed that they didn't hurt each other. That's what I prayed for, right? They got to work it out, man. They got to work it out, not, like, not get dad involved. Well, that's what Martha's doing here. Martha's appealing to dad. Martha's doing what a lot of people do. They look around. She doesn't talk to Mary. She finds the highest authority she could find in the room and appeals to that authority to make it right. Now, here's what I love. Jesus does not take her bait. In fact, here's kind of the way that I picture it. 
Martha comes up. She's all bent out of shape. Lord, don't you care? And I think Jesus went, no, I don't. <laughs> went back to teaching. You know, I, I, that's, I might be reading myself into it just a little bit, okay? No, G you can hear Jesus saying, Martha, no, I don't care. I don't care about your misperceptions about yourself. I don't care about your misperceptions of others. I don't care about how you prioritize the wisdom that you've learned from the world around you over my wisdom. But Martha, I do care about you. And here's the most powerful thing, and it, it's implied in the passage. It's kind of like at the end of the story of the prodigal son. There's an invitation here. The invitation is, Martha, Mary chose what is best, and you can too. You could put away this old style, this old pattern. You see, that's the second thing about what it means to sit at Jesus' feet, is to emulate the pattern of life established by Jesus. To emulate. See, in our schooling in these days, we think of education as filling knowledge into the head. But in the first century, the idea of education was not just getting knowledge, but patterning, patterning your life after a teacher that was worth following. These 12 disciples and Mary in this passage are choosing what is best, which is to pattern their life after Jesus. You see, that's what discipleship is. That's the definition we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks. Discipleship, according to G.B. Caird, is learning from Jesus the pattern of thought and the pattern of heart and the pattern of action in which we're supposed to live. If you haven't been reading your Bible lately, a great place to restart, or if you've never gotten into a habit of reading your Bible, a great place to start is just to look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and start reading with this in mind. What is the pattern of life that I'm learning from Jesus? What does that pattern say about how I'm supposed to follow Jesus today? And when you read you're going to find what we have found as a church family and what thousands and thousands of Christians over the last 2,000 years, actually millions and millions of Christians have found over the last 2,000 years, there's a, a basic tried and true way of learning and following that pattern of Jesus. See, the pattern of Jesus revolves around five basic principles, five principles that are supposed to be primary. They're supposed to be at the top of, of life for everyone who considers themselves a follower of Jesus. And Jesus invites us to put those things as first rather than trying to fit them into the pattern that we've decided to live for ourselves. And when you read through the Gospels, you'll see these five patterns, worship and evangelism and discipleship and ministry, and fellowship. In fact, this church had built into its DNA these five primary principles, and quite frankly, it's one of the reasons why I chose to be here, why I wanted to be here, because this church said what it wanted to become. But I can tell you, just like in your life, we as a church family always struggle with what we say about ourselves and falling short and trying to live towards what we say about ourselves. As most of you know, we have not arrived. But we keep striving and seeking to grow and live out this calling. See, when you see Jesus, what he's doing in this scene right here, you can see the discipleship, the ministry, and the fellowship all at work right here. He's created this circle where he allows people into his presence. He creates space, that's what fellowship is. And in the context of that fellowship, there's instruction taking place. There's the pattern of life being passed on. We call that discipleship. Someone who's being equipped 
and growing. Quite often then what you'll see out of this time of discipleship, Jesus will launch out with his friends, his disciples, his apostles, and he will go out into the environment around him and he'll do ministry. He'll, he'll join what the heavenly father is up to. In fact, the scene we looked at last week, he fed the 5,000. He did ministry, he loved people, he met them where they were at, and then he retreated again and he rested into a place of fellowship with his friends. And you'll see Jesus do this, which is so different than the group that he comes into primary conflict with in the, in the Gospels, right? So different than the Pharisees. In fact, this is something we need to celebrate about this passage about Martha. Martha might have got a lot of things wrong, but you know what she got right? She welcomed Jesus into her presence. She welcomed Jesus into her house. The Pharisees don't do that. And what's cool about Jesus is he's welcomed in, and guess what? He came in and he had a seat, but he also doesn't go along with her false patterns. And when you welcome Jesus into your life, just know he's going to love you, he's going to care about you, and he's going to look at you and go, oh, Dan. Dan, Dan, Dan. Wait, wave your hand, Dan. We just want everybody to see you. Dan, Dan, Dan. Oh, you get so many things wrong but I love you, I love you, and I'm gonna keep inviting you to get the one thing right, which is putting Jesus first. You see, Martha emulates the heart of Jesus in what we call evangelism, which the biggest thing about evangelism, by the way, is not having content to share with another individual. The biggest thing about evangelism is actually crossing over real and imagined borders to build a relationship with somebody who's not already part of your life. And Jesus does it throughout the stories of his life. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he, he goes and builds a re relationship with the cripple and the beggar and the leper. He goes and meets the bleeding woman and the centurion. Time after time after time, he includes people, the Pharisees, the religious people would have never included. And he points them all to the one thing that matters most. And you want to know what the one thing that matters most is for every single one of you? And I say this unapologetically, the most important thing for all of us is to learn to worship God. You were made to worship. I am made to worship. I am made to be in a love relationship with God where I learn to worship him in this place where he says he shows up in the gathering of his people. This is why it says in the book of Hebrews, we should not neglect the gathering as some are in the habit of doing because this is why God created us because Jesus says that if we stopped singing, the rocks themselves would cry out. And we learn to follow and worship Jesus in our daily time of worship, the quiet time of our own reading of the scripture and praying. Hey, if you haven't been praying at all, Start with zero prayers a day to one prayer a day. And trust me, Jesus is going to say, well done. I love you. I just want to talk to you. I just want to relate to you. I just want to be with you. And learning most of all, everything I've talked about is learning the pattern of life established by Jesus. And that's above all else, worship. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 12, listen, be a daily and living sacrifice, setting aside the patterns of this world and instead offering yourself to the Lord and following his ways as being wise and better than all else. And that's an invitation, thanks be to God, that he always gives to us. Here's the really good news for all of you. It is really good news, and we believe this to our core, that you do not have to have this all figured out before you arrive. Otherwise, trust me when I tell you, none of us would be allowed in the room. You see, Christ community is this place where we see modeled in the life of Jesus, and we try to follow his pattern, and we try to get better at it every day. Christ community is this place where you can belong while you figure out what it means to believe and we point you to the pattern of how Jesus behaves.
And as we live together and we stop getting hung up on the expectations that we have for others, because that's what Martha is doing, right? She's getting hung up on the expectations she has for others. And we start focus, focusing instead on Jesus and realizing that when we make space for the Holy Spirit to show up, believe it or not, some people might take baby steps, including ourselves, towards following the Lord. That's what it means to be a disciple. And that's what it means to be a community of disciples. So as you get invited over the next couple weeks to say yes to pathways of fellowship and pathways of ministry and pathways of discipleship and pathways of evangelism, I hope you'll be encouraged to say yes. And remember, one of the greatest enemies for every single person in the room to being a fully committed follower of Jesus Christ is a word that nobody likes, and that's the word commitment. But Jesus invites us to commit our entire life and our entire being to him. And what I love about what we do here as a church is we have all these different pathways to check in and get connected where we learn this pattern of following Jesus together. I hope you are inspired and encouraged to take another step here over the next several weeks towards discipleship and towards learning this pattern of following and loving Jesus as first in your life. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, thanks for this morning, and thanks for your truth, and thanks for Martha, God. Oh, how many times am I like Martha? But thank you, Lord, too, for Mary, who did as what's said in the passage, did what is best, which is to put you first. God, let us each see and understand and, and perceive clearly that next step, that even if it's the smallest step possible, to see that next step that you're inviting us into for our own personal growth in following you as Lord and Savior. Speak to each heart as they need to hear it. And God, bless those who already know they fall short. To hear your words, Lord, that you accept us and love us, not because we're perfect, but because you just love us and accept us and forgive us because that's who you are and what you're about. Let us grow in faith and trust in that truth. And we pray this in the beautiful and mighty and wonderful name of Jesus Christ and all who agree say together.